Heavenly Father, we thank you. We praise you for your word. It is the truth. We do receive it written in our heart and mind. Thank you for the revelation of it. We will be hearers and doers of it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated if you would. We began sharing with you this morning on the subject of the heart. We talked about understanding why the heart is important. We'll review a few things. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. When you receive Jesus Christ as personal Lord and Savior and get born again, you get a new spirit, the spirit of Jesus Christ. Not only do you get a new spirit, you also get a new heart. Many people have taught that the spirit and the heart are the same. Erroneously, it is not so. The spirit that you get is the spirit of Christ. The heart is different. The heart can have evil in it, while the spirit of Christ is not going to have evil in it. Of course, you receive the Holy Spirit. It comes to dwell in that spirit. There's no evil in the Holy Spirit. But you can have evil in your heart, and that is so important. The Word is written in our heart, as we talked about. We pointed out that the Word, written in your heart, the heart is the inward man, the inner man on the inside. We looked at different scriptures on that. It's called the hidden man of the heart as well. We also saw that the Word that goes into the heart is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. We pointed out that the word thoughts mean, refers to the inward reasonings, while the intense refers to the inward intentions or purposes. And this all comes from your heart on the inside of you. Now, we also pointed out that this word that gets sown in your heart, the devil will try to take this word out. We see in Matthew chapter 13 that we looked at, verse 19, When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, it catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. The devil will come to try to take the word out of the heart. If you hear and do the word and believe the word, and you guard that word in your heart, he will not be able to take that out. We see in Mark's account, chapter 4, of the parable of the sower, in verse 15, these are by the wayside where the word is sown. When they've heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts, meaning that he wants to get this word out. Now, if we believe the word and keep it there, it will produce what God purposes to bring forth his salvation, his promises, his victory in our life. Luke 8, 12, these are by the wayside of they that hear, then cometh the devil and taketh away the word of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Now we pointed out, that the word here, believe, when it says they should believe, it's not a good translation. It is a participle in the Greek, and the participle would be translated, as Young's brings it forth, having believed. Otherwise, as the word comes into you and you believe it, having believed, then the next statement is made. In other words, it's not all that they believe and be saved, all in one statement. Having believed, then it says, as Young's brings out, that they may be saved, because this is the next statement, and this is the main statement of that clause. But this is also, as we pointed out this morning, a subjunctive mood verb. The subjunctive mood is a mood that is expressing something that is contrary to fact, that is conditional upon conditions being met. In other words, this is not saying that because you believe, you're saved. It says, having believed that they might be saved, is the way you would translate this, if they meet the conditions. We're going to have to walk in line with the conditions to see the salvation of the Lord be manifest. And we've done a whole study on that about the conditions that are necessary to see salvation come forth in our life. In other words, you and I must believe the word, do the word, walk in line with the word, and we will see the salvation. And this also refers to the healing, the restoration, the preservation, being kept safe and sound, God will accomplish all these great things in our life. Another thing that we pointed out this morning that's really important is your heart is so important because God is looking on your heart. Remember, this is the inward man, the inner man, the hidden man of the heart. 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. The Lord said to Samuel, 
Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth, for man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. He sees the real intents, the real desires, what's on the really motivating you on the inside in your heart. God looks on the heart. Now, as he looks at our heart, what's he looking for? He's looking for a perfect heart. He's looking for a heart that's walking in line with the Word of God. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. We saw this this morning, but we bring it out again. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. When you and I have a perfect heart towards the Lord, he will show himself strong on your behalf. He goes on and he says, Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. Well, he wasn't going to see the Lord bringing forth God working strong on his behalf. Why? Because he did foolishly. And who's this talking about? This is talking about Asa. Asa was a king who did good things and relied on the Lord and had peace and no wars for a long time. But then he made a big mistake. And Hanani the seer came to Asa, as it says here in verse 7, the king of Judah, and he said to him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria, and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand, instead of being destroyed, which he was supposed to be destroyed. Instead, he relied on the king of Syria, which was a mistake, instead of looking to the Lord. He goes on in verse 8. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host? There was like a million of them that God, that God smote. With very many chariots and horsemen. Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thy hand. And they smote them and they got the victory. Why? Because he relied on the Lord. Now what happens? Because he didn't rely on the Lord, that shows that he did foolishly. If you and I don't trust in the Lord, we will do foolishly. And he says, from henceforth, you'll have wars, you'll have continual problems if you do not rely on the Lord. We need to trust in the Lord. He's looking at our heart. We need to believe his word, operate in faith, and know that he will bring his promises to pass. We need to trust him. If we try to go some other way, then we've done foolishly, and we're going to have wars, as we see. Another scripture that we looked at that's important in Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4 we see in verse 20 and following. God's word gets written in your heart and it gets written in your mind. Verse 20, my son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings. Let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart. God wants to keep the word in the midst of our heart. And he tells us to keep them. This means to guard. When God's word comes into your heart, he wants you to guard the word by doing it walking in line with it and resisting all temptations that the devil would bring to try to take the word out of your heart. Because the word, there's life unto those that find them and health to all their flesh. God's word will produce all these things. Verse 23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Now this word, keep, is a little different word, not sar, which really means to watch over in keeping it. You need to watch over your heart Make sure that you don't have anything evil come into your heart whatsoever. For out of it are the issues, or this means the outgoings of life. It's going to come forth out of the heart. Now we pointed out that the effects of the word in your heart is it gets written in your heart, gets written in your mind. We saw the fact that this is by the working of the Holy Spirit. We also saw that when the word is in your heart, you will delight to do the will of God. You will have the joy and rejoicing in your heart. And when the word is hidden in your heart, you will not be sinning against God and none of your steps will slide. These are all points that we looked at this morning when we were talking about this. As well, as you get the knowledge of God, which is the word revealed to you in the soulish realm, knowledge is pleasant to your soul. Then as you do the word, it produces under spiritual understanding, which is of the heart. And then as you continue in that, it'll produce the wisdom of God, which also is of the heart on the inside of you. Now we talked about what we do with our heart, and one of the things that's most important for everybody is we must give our heart to the Lord. We see Proverbs 23, 26. 
My son, give me thine heart, and let thine eyes observe my ways. You need to give God your heart. Yield your heart unto him. Make the decision that you are not going to walk in your own ways. You are going to walk in the ways of the Lord. We also talked about the fact that God looks on the heart and he is going to deal with your heart and he's going to examine you to see whether you're going to walk in the ways of the Lord. We saw a couple scriptures we'll look at over in Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 2. You'll remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble thee, to prove thee, to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or not. In the keeping of the commandments, then the word will stay in your heart. And of course, that's how he's going to know what's in your heart. He's going to humble us. He is going to prove us or test us and, and find out whether or not we are truly walking in the way of the Lord or not. God will find out what is in your heart, and it is shown by your walk, by your works, by your fruit, by the things that you are doing in your life. Now tonight we're going to continue on, and we're going to talk about qualities that are necessary for you to have a right heart before the Lord. Just because you're born again with a new heart doesn't mean that your heart's right before the Lord, because you can have evil in it. We see in Exodus chapter 35, in verse 5, he said, Take ye from among you an offering unto the Lord. Whosoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it, an offering of the Lord, gold and silver and brass. God's looking for you to do everything with a willing heart. You don't do things because you have to. You don't do things because you ought to or it's a religious duty or whatever. You do things with a willing heart. You want to. You want to obey God. A willing heart is so important if you are going to be pleasing unto the Lord. And he brought this out. Again, verse 21. They came, everyone whose heart stirred him up, and everyone whom his spirit made willing. They brought the Lord's offering to the work of the tabernacle of congregation for all his service and for the holy garments. Notice, if you have a willing heart, your heart is going to stir you up to do the things that God wants. Your heart should be stirred up God shouldn't have to prod you or get after you or try to get you, you know, going to do the things that God wants. With a willing heart, you will be stirred up and ready to carry out what God wants for you to do. Verse 29, the children of Israel brought a willing offering unto the Lord, every man and woman whose heart made them willing to bring for all manner of work which the Lord had commanded to be made by the hand of Moses. Now, how is the heart going to be made willing? It's because of the word in you. God's word in you gives you God's desires. It gives you the, the word of God that's going to inspire you. It's going to show you what is right in order for what you to do, what you're to do, and that will cause you to have a willing heart on the inside of you. This brings us to the next point. If we're going to have a right heart before God and get a willing heart, then we have to have a seeking heart because we need to seek after him. Deuteronomy 4, verse 29. He says that if thou from thence shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. You're going to have to seek after him. It's going to take some effort on your part. You've got to spend some time in the Word of God, studying the Word of God, praying, praising, worshiping, doing the things that the Word says, being a doer of the Word, applying it in your life meditating on it, you're going to put some time in. And this is what you're going to do every day, is you're seeking after him. And when you seek him, it says, with all your heart, with all your soul. You're not going through the motions. You are seeking him to get revelation of his ways, so you'll know him, so you'll walk in his ways, and see him accomplish everything that he wants in you and through you. We come down to chapter 5, verse 29. He says, oh, that there was such a heart in them, he's lamenting because there wasn't one, that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Here, he's talking about how important your heart is and what's the benefit of it. He wanted us, our heart would be fearing the Lord, a heart that would be keeping the commandments always, with the result being it will be well with you if you do this. 
and with your children forever. Otherwise, you won't see evil coming. God will be ministering to you. You'll be well with you. You'll be blessed. You'll be prospered. You'll be healed. You'll be seeing God accomplish great things, not only with you, but also with your children, if they will do the very same thing. That's why you teach your children the way of the Lord, to be a doer of the word, to have the fear of God, and to keep the commandments. Of course, the commandments we're under, remember, are the commandments of the New Testament. Another thing that we must have, Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might, everything that you have. You are going to love him. And if you love the Lord, how do we show that? We know that from the New Testament. We go over to John chapter 14. What Jesus said, verse 15, he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Keeping the commandments of the Lord, which is keeping what his word says, as we see in verse 21. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me will be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. Otherwise, God just doesn't manifest himself to just anybody. He only manifests himself to those that meet the conditions that really love him, the ones that keep his commandments, that have his commandments. And how do you get the commandments? You have them because you sought after him. You got the word. You get the word in you. And then you keep him because you carry them out in your life. Verse 23, Jesus said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. So loving Jesus, loving God, is not just keeping commandments, but it's keeping his words, whatever he says to do. So not just the commandments, but whatever he's directed us to do in the word, we are to be hearers and doers of the word. That shows that you really love the Lord. So you need a heart that loves him. Now how are you going to, how are you going to get this? You're not going to manufacture it yourself. It's going to come from the Word in you. The Word in you gives you that desire to want to do the things that God has called you to do. You've got to make sure that you're a doer of the Word so that the Word will stay in your heart. It'll keep that motivation before you to walk in His ways and keep His commandments. We see another thing in Deuteronomy 10, 12. Now, Israel, what doth the Lord thy God require of thee but to fear the Lord? thy God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, and to serve the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul. We've already seen about the, having a heart that fears the Lord. Here it's speaking about walking his ways and loving him and serving the Lord. You're going to serve the Lord with all your heart and all your soul. You're not just going to do it half-heartedly. You've got to make sure that you're serving him. And you're not serving him sometimes and then going off and doing your own thing. No, you're going to serve the Lord because you are bought with a price, you're a purchased possession, you belong to Him, and He wants you to serve Him in all that you do and everything in your life. Another thing that we see is you need to be one who is a giver. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 7. If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, Thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from thy poor brother. Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto him, and surely lend him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. You're going to be a giver. God wants us to give out. Verse 10, You shall surely give him, and thine heart shall not be grieved when thou givest unto him. You give joyfully. Because that for this thing the Lord thy God shall bless thee in all thy works, and in all that thou puttest thy hand unto. You give out to minister to others, God will give back to you. When you give, it shall be given unto you. You want to be sure that you have a giving heart, so you give out to the things that God wants. He says, The poor shall never cease out of the land, therefore I command thee, saying, Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to the poor, to the needy, and thy land, to help minister unto them. We also see over in Joshua, chapter 14, verse 7, the word needs to be brought in your heart and kept in your heart. Remember that God's the one who's going to come to prove us. He's going to try us. He's going to test us to see whether we're going to walk in his ways or not. Well, this is talking about Caleb here. He passed the test. This is a testimony. Joshua 14, verse 7. Forty years old was I when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in mine heart. He brought 
the, according to the word in his heart. What about the rest of the guys? Remember, there were 12 spies that went in. Nevertheless, my brethren that went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Because they, he didn't, he, they didn't have the word in their heart anymore. They were moved by the giants. They were moved by what they saw. They were convinced that they were grasshoppers. And they thought that the enemy, you know, they thought they were grasshoppers as well. He said, but I wholly follow the Lord my God. If you don't keep the word in your heart, you won't have that attitude, that faith, that knowing of what God will accomplish for you. Instead, you could get affected by the enemy. And that's what happened to all of them. They got moved by what they saw, remember? They saw the giants, everything they saw, saw, saw. If you remember that in Numbers 13, they got moved by the, looking at what the natural. Instead of keeping their eyes on the word, keeping their eyes on him, keeping the word in their heart, believing the word, and holding on to it. He held on to it. Notice what his testimony is. He wholly followed the Lord. If you're going to have a right heart before him, you're going to get the word in you, you're going to keep the word in you, and you're going to wholly follow the Lord. You're not going to let the word be taken out of you whatsoever. Another thing that's important if you're going to have a right heart before the Lord, you can't have any idols before you. Anything else being a source. Joshua 24, 23. Now therefore put away, said he, the strange gods which are among you, and incline your heart unto the Lord God of Israel. You've got to put away anything that would hinder you from walking in the ways of the Lord. Nothing can be a source outside of God. You don't look to people. You don't look to money. You don't look to possessions. You don't look to things. You don't, you don't look to anything. Anything that's what a God, a God is something that's a source other than the true and living God that you're looking to. That's a strange God. If you put them away, then you will incline your heart unto the Lord. You can't allow yourself to have any other source other than the Lord. If so, then you won't walk in the ways of the Lord, and you won't have a heart that's right before him. Another thing that we see, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 35. He said, I'll raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in mine heart and in my mind. Well, how does God reveal that to us? Through the word. And what does it do? It gets written in our heart, in our mind, so we will have the heart and the mind like the Lord, have the same motivations, same way of thinking as he. And he said, I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed forever, a faithful one who will do what's in his heart and mind. This means if you're going to have, you're going to be a faithful one. You're going to be a doer of the word. God wants to you to be a doer of the word, and he can count on you, that you're faithful, that he knows what you can do. You're going to carry it out. You've got to be faithful. Faithfulness precedes promotion, not only in the natural, but also in the realm of the spirit. God's looking for those who have a heart that is faithful unto the Lord. If so, it's going to be evident, of course, because you're going to be doing the word consistently and you walk in the ways of the Lord, then God's going to see that he can trust you and know that you will carry out what he commands you to do. 1 Samuel 12, verse 24. Only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he hath done for you. Again, maintaining the fear of the Lord serving him and the only way you can serve him is in truth according to the word you can't serve him in the flesh you can't serve him according to your way you know so many people have their way of doing things i hear even people even the ministering you know the things of deliverance or healing or whatever well this is the way i do it no any way outside of the word of god is not god's way it must be in line with the word you're going to serve him in truth with all your heart if it's not in line with the word then it's definitely not of the Lord. 1 Samuel 13, verse 14. He says, Now thy kingdom shall not continue, for the Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. That tells you something. A man that God considers to be one who's after his own heart is one that keeps what the Lord commands him. If you're a doer of the word, then God sees that you're one who's after his heart. 
if you deviate from the word and you're going to do it your way or do something else, we're not a person that's after his own heart. And because the fact that Saul wasn't here, the kingdom isn't going to continue, he got it taken away from him. God wants us to know that we are going to walk after his ways and we're going to show that we are after his own heart because we are going to do all that he's commanded us. Keeping the New Testament commands is absolutely essential. Another thing we see over in 1 Kings chapter 9, verse 4. All these things are important for you to have a right heart before the Lord. 1 Kings 9, verse 4. If thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, in integrity of heart, and a brightness of heart, to do according to all that I have commanded thee, and will keep my statutes and my judgments, then I'll establish the throne of thy kingdom upon Israel forever, as I promised to David thy father, saying, There shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. So the key is walking with integrity of heart, uprightness, uprightness, you're walking in the way of the Lord, and evidence of that is you're doing according to all that he's commanded, and you keep the statutes, you keep the judgments of the Lord, you carry out the things that he wants you to do. Walk. The walk is what counts. Walk is step by step, continuous. Not because I did it once, not because I said I'm going to do it. Many people have the talk, but not the walk. It's if you walk it out, and that's going to be evidenced by consistency, evidenced by fruit, evidenced by your works, the things that you're doing whether you are a consistent doer of the things that he wants. That's the one who is going to be ruling and reigning because he said he would establish the throne of his kingdom and he would rule and he would reign. We see over in 1 Kings 15 something interesting, speaking about here in verse 1, Now in the 18th year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. This guy was reigning. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Maacai, the daughter of Abishalom. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. And his heart was not perfect, but the Lord is God, as the heart of David his father. You cannot walk after the sins of your forefathers. You say, well, I got all these inherited generational curses, and I got all these demons have come in from inherited generational, three and four generations back, and they're trying to drive me to walk in those ways. Well, that's why you've got to get the word in you, and you've got to conquer all those things that are in you from inheritance. And so you've got to correct all those problems. We can't make the excuse that, well, I, it was the way I was from day one because of the sins of the forefathers. No. He wants us to correct all those problems, and he wants us also to cast out all the evil spirits that are come in from that in order to get set free. If we will walk in the, correct, in the ways of the word and correct all these problems, then that'll show that our heart is perfect before the Lord. Well, he didn't. He walked in all the sins. He just continued in those ways. And that shows a heart is not perfect before him. Here's another interesting point in verse 14. Here it's talking about Asa. The high places were not removed. Nevertheless, Asa's heart was perfect with the Lord all his days. It's because he did do the things that God wanted him to do, even though he didn't get everything done. This means that as you are following the Lord and doing what he tells you to do, and you're accomplishing some of the things, let's say you don't get it all done. Well, at least you were doing what he wanted you to do, and you may not have accomplished everything, but you were on the road following what God told you to do. You were working for him. You were serving him. You were doing, conquering the enemies, even though you may not have gotten everything done, but he was following the way of the Lord. His heart was considered perfect before the Lord. We see over in 2 Kings chapter 20, The reason I say that last scripture is some, many people think that, well, if I don't get anything accomplished, am I going to be okay with the Lord and my heart considered perfect? Yeah, if you're doing what he says, continually walking in it, you know. Just be consistent in doing what he wants you to do. 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1. In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death. And the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. 
He turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked with before thee in truth, so he had a consistent walk, with a perfect heart, and have done that which was good in thy sight. Well, that's a tremendous testimony. He had a good testimony. He could bring that before the Lord of what he'd done. And Hezekiah wept sore. Came to pass, afore Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, I have heard thy prayer. God will respond to your prayers when you bring forth truth to him. I've seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up into the house of the Lord, and I will add unto thy days fifteen years. He got fifteen more years. And I'll deliver thee in this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria, and will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. Why was all this? Because, as it says, when he spoke forth, he walked before him in truth, he had a perfect heart, he did what was good in the sight of the Lord. This is showing a right heart. If you will walk before him in truth, if you will walk consistently with the word, if you will have a perfect heart and do the things that are good in his sight, then God will take note of your prayer, he'll take note of you, and in this case, he saw 15 more years added to his life. Over in 2 Chronicles, chapter 19, we see another principle of those that have a good, right heart before the Lord. 2 Chronicles 19, 9, he charged them, saying, Thus shall you do in the fear of the Lord faithfully and with a perfect heart. Faithfully and with a perfect heart. Again, faithfulness, steadfastness, he can count on you. He knows you're going to carry out the things that he wants. We can't be on one minute and off the next minute. He wants us to be showing forth that we can count on him. You're trustworthy. You're shown to be faithful. Being faithful is so important. That's, that's a key for God to choose those to, for the things that he has for them. In fact, remember over in Nehemiah, Verse 7, Thou art the Lord thy God, which did choose Abram, and brought him forth out of the Ur of the Chaldees, and gave us him the name Abraham. Now why did he choose Abram? He found his heart faithful before thee. When he finds your heart faithful, then you'll be chosen for the things that he might have for you. He made a covenant with him. Otherwise, faithfulness was the prerequisite for him to be chosen by God and for, for him to be making a covenant with God and all the great things that happened through Abraham. So God wants you to be faithful. Another thing, if you will do all the things that God tells you to do, totally committed to walk in his ways, that means you get rid of all the things of this world. You get rid of all the things that are time wasters. You get rid of all the things that are the flesh. You put his word first place. 2 Chronicles 31, 21. And every work that he began in the service of the house of God and the law and the commandments to seek his God, he did it with all his heart and he prospered. God wants to prosper us. You do something with all your heart in obedience to what God's telling you to do, God says that he will prosper you and bring his blessings upon you in your life. Another thing that we see if we're going to have a right heart in 2 Chronicles 34, over in verse 27. Because thine heart was tender, and thou didst humble thyself before God, when thou heardest his words against his place, against the inhabitants thereof, and humbled thyself before me, did rend thy clothes and weep before me, I've even heard thee also, saith the Lord. What was the mark here? He had a tender heart. He had a soft, yielded heart, tender heart. Don't be one who's kind of hard heart, one who's kind of stubborn, stern, resistant. God has to prod you and get to you. You should have a tender heart. Tender heart and humble yourself before God, ready to do the things he wants. A prideful heart is no good. We can't have pride in our heart whatsoever. We must be humble before the Lord. In fact, pride will deceive you. You must make sure that you have a heart that's right before him. Another thing, you want to have a heart that's prepared to do the things God wants. 
You prepare your heart. We see this in Ezra chapter 7, verse 10. Ezra had prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord. You know, he just didn't wake up and says, well, I guess maybe I should do something. No, he prepared his heart ahead of time. He was ready to do those things. You should be prepared, ready to do the things, not like, you know, somebody has to get after you to do things. You prepared yourself to do all the things that God wants you to do. He prepared his heart to seek the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach in Israel statutes and judgments. You seek it, you find, you do it, you want to be prepared, you're going to put this in operation. And also, you're going to get, get this in you to the place where you can teach it to others. So that's not just hearing it for yourself. You get it in you so you can teach this word to others because God wants us to go out and make disciples of others. And you're going to need to teach the word that you hear in order to bring them to the place of being able to respond to the word, of course, and, and walk in the ways of the Lord. Psalms 112. Psalms 112 tells us a lot of things in this chapter. Praise ye the Lord. Blessed is the man that fears the Lord, the feareth the Lord, and delights greatly in his commandments. That shows someone's got a right heart. He has the fear of the Lord. He delights greatly. And remember, the word the jo produces the joy and the rejoicing in your heart. You'll delight greatly in doing the commandments. His seed will be mighty upon the earth. The generation of the upright shall be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. His righteousness endureth forever. And unto the upright there will arise light in the darkness. He's gracious and full of compassion and righteous. And the good man shows favor and lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. This is someone who's got a heart that's right before God, walking in the ways of the Lord. Verse 6, Surely he shall not be moved forever. The righteous shall be in everlasting remembrance. He shall not be afraid of evil tidings. doesn't matter what's coming. His heart is fixed, trusting in the Lord. That's important. You need your heart fixed, trusting in the Lord. Nothing is going to move you whatsoever. A heart that's fixed, firm, stable. You're not, you know, all over the place. One minute you're, you know, going the right direction. The next minute, you know, who knows where you are. No. Fixed, trusting in the Lord. His heart's established. That's what God wants. He wants you so established that nothing can shake you whatsoever. And he shall not be afraid. Now, if you've got fear, your heart's not established. You've got to get all that fear out. He shall not be afraid until he see his desire upon his enemies. And you will see God destroy your enemies and put them underfoot. Another thing that we need is we need a merry heart. A heart that's full of joy. Proverbs 15, verse 13. A merry heart makes a cheerful countenance. That's what he wants for us. But by sorrow of the heart, the spirit's broken. You don't want to have sorrow in your heart. You want to have a merry heart. God wants us to have this. When you have a merry heart, it goes on in verse 15. All the days of the afflicted are evil, but he that has a merry heart will have a continual feast. Otherwise, you'll be blessed. And what's going to be a result of a merry heart? Because you have the word in you that's the joy and rejoicing of your heart. In fact, we ought to probably go back, since we've mentioned that a couple times, for you who weren't here and didn't see this this morning, Jeremiah 15, 16. Thy, <clears throat> thy words were found, which means you were seeking after them, and I did eat them, meaning you took it within you, you digested it in you, you put it in operation in your life, and thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. If you're lacking joy and rejoicing in your heart, you're lacking the word in your heart. Or else you're letting the devil take it out. Or you've let a lot of other evil things get into your heart. You've got to guard your heart so that you don't let the devil come in and affect the word that's in your heart. God wants you to have a merry heart. Another scripture on this. Proverbs chapter 17, over in verse 22. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. It'll be minister healing to you. But a broken spirit dryeth the bones. Hmm, that sounds like arthritis, degeneration, deterioration to the bones, joints, marrow, all these things. That's why don't let yourself get broken hearted. 
Regardless of what the circumstances, you need to keep a merry heart. You need to keep rejoicing in the Lord. You need to keep the Word in you. You need to keep your eyes on the Lord, not on the circumstances. People get a broken spirit, they get broken heart, or they get sorrow of the heart because of negative circumstances if they let them get to them. You know, we got to rise above it. We got to get our eyes on the Lord. We got to have a merry heart. It will do good like a medicine. God wants you to rejoice. Remember what it says in the New Testament rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And that was a time in the Philippian jail when Paul and Silas were there. They had every reason in the natural to get depressed. It looks like it's all over. No. They rejoiced in the Lord. They prayed. They praised. God caused an earthquake. <laughs> they got out of that thing. The Philippian jailer got saved as well. I'm in his house. God did great things. So get your eyes on the Lord and know that he'll bring you out of things instead of being moved by your circumstances. The Bible says, 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, rejoice evermore. He wants a rejoicing spirit. You know, you need that, especially when you attacks the enemy. Count it all joy when you're enveloped by all these temptations. You need joy because joy protects your faith. Otherwise, it'll take you out of being in faith and let the enemy have place. Keep a rejoicing, merry heart before the Lord. Another thing. That's something a lot of Christians have a problem with, it seems, because they get blown away by circumstances too much. We've got to learn to get our eyes on the Lord and rise above them. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. When it talks about the pure, this is one who has been clean. That's why we want to have a clean, pure heart before the Lord. What's going to happen? You're going to get revelation. You're going to see God. You're going to see revelation from Him. People that don't have a pure heart, an impure heart because of sin and evil things that come in, they aren't going to get revelation from the Lord. Another thing we need, Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. The yoke is what couples you together. And remember, he says that, for I am meek and lowly in heart. That's what we need and you shall find rest unto your souls. God wants us to have rest. He doesn't want us to be in turmoil, in trouble, or upset. My yoke is easy and my burden's light. What couples together with him, as you learn of him, you'll always stay in peace. Remember, thou wilt keep in perfect peace his mind is stayed on thee because he trusts in him. You should have a common a rest in your soul all the time. If we're getting upset and we're getting out of sorts, then we're not doing what he says. We're letting the enemy get to us. Meek and lowly heart, one that's totally submitted, submitted, yielded unto the Lord, that's what God wants. You can maintain that attitude at all times. We also need an excellent and a good heart. In Luke chapter 8, when it talks about the bringing forth of fruit on the good ground in the parable of the sower, Luke 8, 15, but that on the good ground are they which in an honest and a good heart. Honest is the word kalos in the Greek. This means an excellent in quality, excellent in quality, and a good heart. A good heart is that which has had good things deposited in, in it. We talked about the one who has the good deposit in his heart brings forth good things today, earlier. So in an excellent heart and in a good heart that's had good things put into it, Having heard the word, they keep it and they bring forth fruit with patience or steadfastness. So if you're going to be the good ground that produces the fruit, you must have an excellent heart and you must have a good deposit in your heart, which is the things of the word of God. And of course, guarding your heart, because remember, the devil's after the word, trying to get it out of you. In the book of Acts, after they got born again, here we see in Acts chapter 2, verse 46, they continually daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. This gladness isn't just a rejoicing. This is the word agaliasis in the Greek, which is different from the word for joy or rejoicing, which is Cairo. This one talks about extreme joy. I mean, exulting. I mean, the joy just bubbling over all over the place. Not just a little bit of joy extreme joy and gladness. I mean, they were excited. And singleness of heart, that's what God wants. 
their, their eyes are on the Lord. They're all excited about what God's doing. And if our eyes are on the Lord and we're doing His Word, we should be excited about what He's doing in our life because He's bringing forth His promises and bringing revelation and, and teaching us His ways and bringing us to repentance to turn away from things we shouldn't, and that's a good thing, and bringing forth His promises and building us up and strengthening and bringing fruit, more fruit and much fruit in our life. Another thing that we see in Acts chapter 11. Acts chapter 11 this is when they were going around to the different churches, sent Barnabas and went as far as Antioch here, who when he came, he had seen the grace of God was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. You're going to cleave unto the Lord because you have a purpose of heart. You know you're going to follow God. You set your purpose. I'm going to follow the Lord. I'm going to do what he tells me to do. My purpose is to serve him in everything that I do. With purpose of heart, we would cleave unto the Lord. That's what God has for every one of us. We've got to have purpose of heart. Not just, uh, you know, whatever wind blows of whether I'm on or off or not. No, you purpose in your heart regardless of what's coming that you're going to cleave unto the Lord. Because the devil will blow all kinds of winds at you, that's for sure. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, we see something else. Verse 7, 37. Nevertheless, he that standeth steadfast in his heart, having no necessity, has power. This the word power is exousia, which means authority. Young's corrects it. It means authority. Over his own will, and hath so decreed in his heart that he will keep his virgin doeth well. This is what a person needs to do so they don't fall in sexual sin. They're going to be steadfast in their heart on the Word. They're not going to let themselves be driven by any necessity coming from the flesh. They have authority over their own will because you've got to set your will that you don't yield to the enemy and choose the wrong thing. Remember, he set before us life and death, blessing and cursing. He tells us to choose life, of course. And he decrees in his heart. He sets his heart. He chooses in his heart that he's going to keep his virgin. That one does well or he does excellently. The word kalos. That's what we need to do. This shows you what it's going to take for you to not give place to sin. You've got to be steadfast. You're going to authority over your will. You're going to decree things in your heart. Set yourself. I will not walk in these ways that are contrary to the word of God. I will only do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Another thing that we see, coming down to this, again, this purpose of heart. 2 Corinthians Chapter 9, over in verse 7. When you are giving, and this is talking about giving forth of offerings, or, or in this case they were giving to different churches and, and to help, help them because they were lacking in different places. Verse 7, every man according as he purposeth in his heart, so let him give. Not grudgingly, or he ought to or should, or of necessity, well, do I have to do this? For God loveth a cheerful, joy, joyous giver. You will be a joyous giver when you purpose in your heart to do what God wants you to do. And you let him be Lord over your pocketbook. No, you're not going to be grudgingly. There's not going to be any fruit in that one. Or of necessity that I have to do it. No, it's all out of a want to. Out of a want to. You purpose in your heart. God loves a joyous giver that you want to give. When you do that, then look at the promise. God is able to make all grace abound towards you, the favor of God towards you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things. That's a promise. He'll meet every need in your life. May abound to every good work. Not only will he give you all sufficiency, he'll even enable you to abound, that's the prosperity of God, to every good work. And that's what he wants for you. He wants us not just to be able to barely get along. He wants us to prosper in everything that we do. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5. Servants, be obedient to them that are your masters. You could think of that as empl employees. Be obedient to your employer, according to the flesh, with fear and trembling, in singleness of your heart as unto Christ, because you're doing your work unto the Lord. Don't be moved by people. Do your work unto the Lord. Not with eye service as a men pleaser, 
but as servants of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. Now, this is a mistake here. It's not heart. I put the cursor over it. It's the word suke. It really means soul. That's why Young's corrects it. Although, we saw in the previous verse that you do it with singleness of heart as unto Christ, but your soul's involved in this. The servants of Christ doing the will of God from the soul as you choose to do what God wants you to do. Your will is part of the soul. So you're going to set your will that you're going to do what God wants with singleness of heart. You're doing it unto the Lord, though. You're working. Everything you're doing is unto the Lord. We see another scripture showing the kind of heart that God wants for every one of us. Colossians 3, verse 22. Servants, again, talking about employees, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service or as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Now, he brings out, fearing God. And whatsoever you do, do it out of, this where it says heartily, this means out of the soul, Here's the word out of, below. There's another word below it, which is the word suke, which means soul. Out of the soul, as Young's brings out, as to the Lord and not unto men. Again, when you do something, you do it unto the Lord, you'll do your very best, not unto men. You get your eyes on men, you could get attitudes, you know, frustrated, angry, you know, I don't like what they're doing and all this. That's a mistake. You do it unto the Lord. You be the best because you're doing everything unto the Lord. And that's important. If everybody would do that, then it would be great in the work workplace. You wouldn't have all these problems that go on. And you wouldn't get attitudes about those that do evil things. Now, in regards to dealing with people, we're always we're commanded to walk in love, but we've got to do it out of a pure heart. 1 Timothy 1.5 now the end of the commandment is charity, that's love, agape, out of a pure heart, a clean heart, and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. Again, we're not faking it. We're doing it truly with faith. And we're not doing it with a bad conscience. No, we're going to have a good conscience. We have forgiven. We've let go of all resentments, bitterness. You can't have any evil stuff in your heart. Whatever's happened, doesn't matter. You've got to let it all go. Forgive, let it go. Don't let the devil work at you through things that have happened to you at any time in your life. Of course, he's a, he brings memory recall spirits to you all the time, trying to bring things up to remind you of all these evil things that happened to get you out of being in line with the Word. You've got to be ready to take your thoughts captive. 2 Timothy 2, verse 22. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, Charity, which is love, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure, clean heart again. Everything you're going to do with a clean heart, you're going to follow the Lord. Whether you're righteousness, faith, love, peace, calling on the Lord, whatever you do. Again, you're living your life under the Lord. That's going to be the key to have a heart that's right before Him. We see also, over in Hebrews, we see more about this. Hebrews chapter 10 Verse 22, let us draw near with a true heart, a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled with an evil conscience, from an evil conscience, our bodies washed with pure water. We're going to have a true heart, a heart that is right before the Lord, not one that's a fake heart, but a true heart. It's going to walk in the ways of the Lord. And again, having been cleansed from all these evil things. Another thing that you're going to be showing the favor of God towards people. Hebrews 13, 9. Be not carried away with diverse and strange doctrines, for it's a good thing that the heart be established with grace, the favor of God. Not with meats or food, which have not profited them that have been occupied therein. You want to be sure you're walking in line with the true doctrine of the Lord, and your heart's to be established with the favor of God. The grace comes from what? the grace of the Word, the Word of His grace in your heart. So having the Word in your heart is going to be important, and that's what you're going to walk by, so you're obedient to do everything God wants. And again, in loving people, we see down in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Seeing you have purified your souls, cleansed your souls, made it holy, in obeying the truth, otherwise that's how you deal with the things in the soul. 
you correct the problems and start obeying the truth. Through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, again, we're not, it's going to be real sincere. You're not just going through the motions. See that you love one another with a pure heart, because you've purified your soul, you've cleaned up, because what comes from the, all the gates you know, in your life is what gets into your heart, all the openings, including what you think, what you feel, the things of the soulish realm. You're going to love one another with a pure heart, fervently, earnestly, intensely. Now, that means a real genuine, not just because I have to, you know. No, you're going to love every single person. That's what he wants, with a pure heart. Always have a pure heart. As we mentioned earlier, we have to forgive. If you do not forgive, you're going to be turned over to the tormentors. In Matthew chapter 18, we see the case where the guy got turned over to the tormentors. Verse 34, the Lord was wroth, delivered him to the tormentors. Well, what was this case? This is the case where the man was forgiven a great debt by his Lord. And then, when someone who owed him something, he wouldn't forgive him a small debt. You know, God gave him the big debt. Why shouldn't he forgive the other guy the small debt? The Lord was wroth, delivered him the tormentors. And what's this pointing towards? The next verse is tell you what it's pointing towards. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, deliver you to the tormentors. If you from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespasses. Did God forgive us of all of our trespasses and sins? Sure. Well, how can we not forgive someone of their trespasses or sins? We must forgive. Remember, if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven of your own sins. Notice, you're going to forgive. This is everybody's talking about his brother in this scripture. It's got to be from your heart. Otherwise, you're not just going through the motions. I'll have to forgive him, I'll forgive him, you know, grudgingly. That's no good. That doesn't make it. You're still going to be turned over to the tormentors. Well, I forgave him. Uh, you didn't do it with the right heart. <laughs> the tormentors are still going to be coming into you. Make sure that you do everything from your heart. It's got to, otherwise, it's going to be genuine on the inside of you. Another thing that we see as we walk in the ways of the Lord, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. We are commanded to walk in love. Verse 12 says, The Lord make you to increase and to abound. I mean, that's not barely walking in love. That's increasing and abounding. You're just functioning in love all the time. In love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. Remember, if we don't have love, we're nothing. <laughs> we're just like, it's like a sounding brass, you know. We're absolutely nothing if we don't operate in love. To the end, what's going to be the result of you operating in love, increasing and abounding in all? To the end, he may establish your heart unblameable in holiness before the Lord. Without walking in love, you'll never be holy. You'll never have a heart that's unblameable. Your heart's to be established unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all the saints. That means all your life. We should always be walking in love at all times. Don't let the devil get to you and get you out of love. Always function. And love is seeing someone as valuable and precious and important, unconditional, without reservation. And that means everybody. Remember, Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies. That's everybody. It doesn't matter who they are. You walk in love towards everybody. And when you operate in love, increase and abound, that will establish your heart unblameable in holiness. And that's what we want to have. You also have to get cleansed, remember, of all these things. Again, we see many scriptures in the New Testament talks about this cleansing or this to get a right heart before the Lord. James chapter 4, verse 8. He says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Purify, cleanse. This tells you something else. Your heart is affected by what's going on in the soulish realm. Because the word double-minded is the word disukos in the Greek, which means two-souled. Disukos is this word. Di means two. Sukos means soul. That's why Young's just translated absolutely literally, you two-souled. <laughs> you can't be two-souled. You've got to be one-souled. You've got to be in line with the Word of God. If you are two-souled, that causes effect on your heart. Because remember, 
What affects your heart? It's everything that's coming in from all the different gates. What you hear, what you speak, what you think upon, and what's coming out all, all from the soulish realm. If you are too souled, you will be, have an impure heart. You've got to purify it by getting yourself single-minded on the Word of God and not giving place to the devil at all in your mind. Another thing, he wants you to get long-suffering. Long-suffering in every situation. James 5.8, be also, it says patient here, but it is the Greek word macrothumia. Macrothumio means to be of long spirit. It means long-suffering. It's been translated long-suffering in many, many places. The other form of this word, and 14 uses 12 times it's translated, the long-suffering and two times patience. But this word here, it actually means long suffering. Young's didn't even pick this one up because patient used to use the word meaning steadfast. Be long suffering, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Long suffering. If you're long suffering, you're not going to get upset with people. You're not going to have negative attitudes against people. You know, you're going to be long suffering in the face of situations, whether things are good or not. And you're going to establish your heart. Get your heart firm, set fast. I will walk in line with the word regardless of what's coming, regardless of what situation is presented before me. Another thing. You are going to sanctify the Lord in your heart. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Otherwise, what's going to be a right heart? A pure heart, a clean heart, a holy heart. One that's a loving heart. All these things. One that's sanctified. Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. Make sure that you're pure and holy. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asks you the reason the hope that's in you with meekness and fear. Again, you're prepared. You're ready to speak forth the things that God would want you to speak forth. Over in 1 John chapter 3. Verse 18, here's another point for having a heart that is right before the Lord. My little children, he says, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and truth. Anybody can say anything they want, but it's going to be shown by actions, isn't it? By your deeds and in truth. Hereby we know we're of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. Otherwise, you assure your heart before him you, you will have this heart persuaded before God that you have a right heart because you do love shown in deed and truth. You work it, you carry it out. It's evidenced by your works, the things you're doing. He goes on and says, if our heart condemn us because we're not doing right, God's greater than our heart and knows all things. And your heart will condemn you and convict you and show you things aren't right. If that's the case, you've got to get it right. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, that means our heart's right, then have we confidence toward God. That means you can't manufacture confidence toward God. Well, I'm just going to have confidence in the Lord and believe, even if you've got unforgiveness, resentment, bitterness, attitudes of heart, it's not going to happen. You're just doing it in your own mind. True confidence before God will be for those whose heart is right before the Lord. If your heart does not convict you because you got a perfect heart. you got a heart that's right. Then, look what it says. Whatsoever we ask, this is the word aiteo, which means a demand of what's due you. We have, we've studied this in the past. It, that's what the word means. It's not the word ask. It's a word aiteo. From Strong's means a demand of what's due you, what you do in prayer by praying the word. We receive lambano, which means to take hold of him. Because why? Because I prayed accurately and that was all? No. Here shows you there's some conditions for you to get your prayers going anywhere. Because we keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight. Otherwise, you're going to have to have a heart that's right before God. And those that keep His commandments and do the things that are pleasing in His sight, they obviously have a heart that's right before God. Their heart's not going to be condemned or convicted because they are walking in the right ways of the Lord. That's what God wants for us. He wants us to have a right heart before the Lord. If we will have a right heart before the Lord, then we will see God do great things in our life. 
over in Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, over in verse 22. When he removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after mine own heart. We saw about that before, but then what's it say about someone whose heart is after the Lord's? Which shall fulfill all my will. If you have a heart that is right before God, because you are seeking Him and got the Word in your heart, and you're ready to do, you have prepared your heart, you fear the Lord, obedient, all these things, you will fulfill all the will of God. Again, you aren't going to be able to do it in the flesh. You're, only, you're not going to do it because I just think I ought to. You're going to only do it because of the Word in you. It's going to be God working in you. Remember, as you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling and always obeying, What's happening? It's God that's at work in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. So it's God who's accomplished these things through the word of God in you. And that's what he wants. He wants you to have a heart that is right before the Lord. If you will do so, then you'll see great blessings come forth. Over in 1 Kings, chapter 8, verse 23. He said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or earth, earth beneath who keepeth covenant mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. What's going to happen if you walk before the Lord with all your heart in line with his word? And you're doing the word. What's the word? It's the word of the covenant. And when you keep the word, what's going to happen? His mercies, which is the love of God in action to minister to your needs, which are new every morning, will be ready to be manifest. He's going to keep covenant and mercy with those that walk before him with all their heart. Again, this is why your heart is so important. Also, God will defend you and protect you in situations if your heart is right before the Lord. Psalm 7, verse 10. My defense is of God, which saves and delivers the upright in heart. If you're upright in heart, no matter what anything's coming against you, God will be your defense. He will defend you. He'll be your shield against the enemy or against whatever attacks would come against you. He will save. He will deliver this means, bring you victory, bring you through whatever situation it is. But the key is to be upright in heart, and that is so important. Another thing, if we will do the things that God wants, and have a heart right before him, God will start putting things in your heart. It's interesting what it says over here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, down in verse 9. It says, But as it's written, Eye is not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. That means God has prepared things for those that love him. Who are the ones that love him? the ones that are keeping his commandments. So if God's prepared the ones to love him, and if you meet the conditions of loving him because you keep the commandments and are walking in all his ways, then what's going to happen? The things he's prepared will enter into your heart. So you're not going to figure them out yourself. You've got to meet God's conditions, and then the things that he has for you will enter into your heart. Many people have a call of God to do things, but they've never done what he said and they never see that that come to pass because it hasn't entered into their heart because they didn't meet the conditions. You've got to meet the conditions. As we have talked about in almost every single subject in the Word of God, there's conditions to see God bring forth promises and His blessings and, and the things that He wants to bring forth in your life. And people say, well, I want to, I want to know what God wants me to do. Well, uh, if you are loving Him, the things that He's prepared for you, he will reveal them to you. He will come and he'll, he'll bring them into your heart as you walk in the ways of the Lord. God is wanting us to do exactly what his word says. And we see if you will do what God says, 1 Samuel chapter 14, over here in verse 6, or verse 7 that is, Psalm verse said to him, Do all that's in thine heart. Turn thee, behold, I'm with thee according to thy heart. Otherwise, the principle is this. If you'll do all that's in your heart, then 
the Lord will be with you as you do the Word. The Word that He puts in you, He wants you to walk it out. He wants you to be a doer of that Word consistently in your life. If you do it, then you're going to see God's blessings come upon you, and you'll see Him bring what He wants. Also, the more that you walk in the ways of the Lord, as we see in 2 Chronicles chapter 15, and you have a heart that's right before Him, He'll bring you into the spiritual rest of God. Look what it says here in 2 Chronicles 15, verse 12. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord God of their fathers with all their heart, with all their soul. I mean, they, they said, hey, we're making this a covenant. We're going to seek Him. Well, actually, you and I have brought, came into that the day you got born again because you came into the new covenant and you're to seek Him. Seek Him with all your heart and all your soul, whether you realize it or not. Whosoever would not seek the Lord God of Israel will be put to death, whether small or great, whether man or woman. And so these guys, they declared this. And all Judah rejoiced at the oath, for they had sworn with all their heart and sought him with their whole desire. And he was found of them. And what happened? The Lord gave them rest round about. If you will seek him with your whole desire, if you will declare that you're going to seek him with all of your heart, what's going to happen? God gave them rest from their enemies. That meant he defeated their enemies. They saw victory. They saw the promises of God come to pass. God will do great things for every single one of us. And one last scripture before we conclude for tonight. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. As we saw this earlier, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect towards him. With a perfect heart, God will show himself strong on your behalf. Is God holding things back? No. What withholds good things? Your sins and iniquities withhold your good things from us, it talks about. He's not holding anything back. If we will walk in the ways of the Lord, he is ready and willing, and he wants us to see all of the blessings of God come forth in our life. But we're going to have to do the things that he says. So we've seen a lot of important things. We need a willing heart. We need a seeking heart that we're going to seek the ways of the Lord. A fear of God heart that we're not going to walk contrary to His Word. Or have a loving heart, keeping His commandments. A serving heart that we're submitted to serve Him because we're, we're going to follow after the way of the Lord. We're going to have a giving heart. We're our givers, not takers. We're going to be getting the Word in our heart and show our faithfulness of walking after it so God can know that we are faithful. We're going to get rid of all idolatry, anything that is not of Him. We're going to make sure that we are, as God said, a man after His own heart, evidenced by your walk. You're going to walk with integrity of heart and uprightness. Remember, your heart is not perfect if you walk in sins. Your own sins or the sins of your forefathers, there's no excuse for any of that. At the same time, if you're walking in the way of the Lord, doing what He wants, and you may not get everything accomplished in your lifetime, but if you're getting a lot and you're doing what He wants and you're on the road, then your heart will be considered perfect before the Lord. Faithfulness is what He's looking at. He's looking at, will you be faithful to carry out the things that He wants? Will you have a tender, humble heart? Will you prepare your heart? Will you trust? Will you have an established heart? Will you have a merry heart? Keep a rejoicing spirit before you. That means we really have to guard against all the things that would try to get to you, get you down, get you depressed, get you upset, get you sorrow, get you frustrated, on and on. There's the devil orchestrates all these things to get to your heart so you don't have a perfect heart, so you don't have a pure heart. It can shut down a lot of the things that God wants to accomplish. We need to get a merry, joyful heart. Have an excellent heart, a good heart, gladness in heart purpose of heart, steadfast in heart, decree things in our heart, singleness of heart, a heart that is tr a true heart, not one that's just going through the motions, forgiving from our heart. As you walk in love, your heart's going to get established unblameable in holiness. And remember, you purify your hearts from all the being too sold 
That's another key. A lot of people don't have a pure heart because they got all kinds of things that are going on in their soul realm. One minute they're on, next, you know, I mean, they're, they're thinking the right, next minute they're thinking negative stuff. You really got to guard that soulish realm. It will affect your heart. Remember what it said, you two-souled are the ones who are double-minded, and that is very important. We're going to be long-suffering. We're going to have a heart be sanctified before the Lord, and we're going to meet the conditions for our heart to be assured and have confidence before the Lord, because you can't manufacture confidence, remember. You have that because of the Word in you, because of a pure heart, a clean heart, because of the fact you keep His commandments and you do the things that are pleasing in His sight. This is all important because what we, we believe with our heart and we release our faith through our heart. Well, if we got all this other negative stuff in, are we going to be able to see our faith work? No, it won't. Remember, if your heart condemns you, <laughs> you can't do anything. The only way you're going to see results is when you have a perfect heart, a pure heart, a clean heart before the Lord. Say this, Heavenly Father, I thank you and praise you for the Word of God that brings revelation of the importance of having a right heart and what is necessary to have a right heart before you in my life. I will do the word. I will meet these conditions. It will be evident in my life as I'm doing the word that we've seen this night that I will have a perfect heart. I thank you for searching my heart proving me to see what's in my heart. It will be evident as I keep the commandments and walk in all your ways. I will get an established heart, a pure heart, a clean heart, a heart that is sanctified, holy before you. I thank you, Lord. I will have a perfect heart. And you will accomplish it because I will meet your conditions of doing the Word and keeping the Word in my heart. I will not let the devil take the Word out of my heart. I will guard it because out of it flow the issues of life. I thank you, Lord. Lord. I will keep my heart with all diligence so that I have a perfect heart before you all the days of my life. And I will fulfill the will of God in my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Now, God's the one who does this through the word in you. But you're the one who has to do the word to see it get accomplished. Praise God. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and praise you for all that you brought forth. Thank you that we have ears to hear. Thank you that if there's areas in our heart that are not right, we're going to clean them up. We are going to get cleansed. If we've been giving place to the enemy through situations and letting ourselves get frustrated, upset, you know, depressed, down, all this, we're not going to let that happen any longer. We're going to keep a merry heart. We're going to keep a rejoicing heart. We're going to guard our heart. We're going to do what you say so that we have a perfect heart before you so you'll show yourself strong on our behalf and you'll conquer our enemies. We'll enter into the rest of God. We'll see every promise come to pass. We will fulfill the will of God in our life. Thank you for this revelation of the importance of doing what's necessary to have a heart that is right before you. We will be doers of this word. Thank you for much fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. Amen. Wednesday night. We're